Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together to encourage one another and to glorify you. I ask that you would give us understanding from your word this morning that, Father, you, you would work through your spirit to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give us a passion to proclaim his gospel and to live in obedience to him. Help us, change us, and transform us that we may know what your will is and that we may be obedient to it. And if there be any here who are lost, just please draw them to yourself today that they may find salvation in Christ. Help me to be faithful to preach your word this morning. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. One of the amazing aspects of the Christian life is the calling that we have to both pattern our thinking and our living after the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are called to imitate him, we're called to know him, to understand him, to be conformed to him by studying the word and submitting to his will. It's really an amazing part of biblical Christianity if you begin to think about it. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You and I need to put on the Lord. We need to walk forward in Him on the basis of the salvation we have been given. We need to cast aside the old man and walk forward according to the ways of our Lord. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. And after making that statement, what the Apostle Paul does is he goes forward to talk about the humility of Christ in coming to the earth in the incarnation, being crucified, dying on behalf of his people. And, and you know, you, you think about that. You think about this high calling that we have as believers to follow Christ and to have our minds conform to Christ. And you understand that the only way that we can do this is by the grace of God. Uh, that we are sinners saved by grace, that we are living in a fallen world and we need the grace of God, not only to be saved, but also to be sanctified, to mature in him. And it's a part of his gift of grace to us that he hasn't left us on our own to try to figure all of this out. He's given us his sufficient word that we might understand truth. And so what does it mean to pattern our thinking, to pattern our living after the Lord? Well, we're going to see this as we continue on in 1 Peter here this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Read that particular passage with me here today. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Forever has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Here in the opening part of this section of Scripture, we see Peter reminding us of what we saw last week, where at the end of chapter 3, he points us to the suffering of Christ. He points us to the reality that Christ himself has come and he has died for us, that our sins might be paid for, and he has given us his perfect righteousness. And so Peter again urges us to remember this truth here at the start of chapter 4, verse 1. And next he gives us a command when he says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. And here is the call to pattern ourselves, to pattern our minds after the ways of Christ, after the Lord. That he came, he suffered, and so we must be ready to suffer for his sake whenever he calls us to. We must even be ready to suffer to the point of physical death. This is going to take a heart full of humility. That's what I want you to see in this passage, that Christ humbles himself, as we see in Philippians chapter 2, which I read a second earlier. He humbles himself, taking on human flesh, going to death. And so also we must humble ourselves. We must be ready to give up our will, to give up the desires of the sinful flesh, and to submit to the will of God. Uh, that we must account his desires, his commands, his will as more valuable than our own. Uh, that we must submit to him in every way. 
That means that we must study Christ to know more of his character, that we must know the Lord, that our hearts might be cultivated by his example, by his teaching. They might be transformed to be humble, that we might submit to him. And next we come upon an interesting phrase here at the end of verse 1. For whoever has ceased in, suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, what does this particular phrase mean? Is Peter saying that we can somehow be perfect, that as soon as you have ever suffered for the faith, at that moment you are zapped and you are perfect from that point forward in your lives? Is he saying that we will never sin again at some point in our Christian walk with the Lord? Well, I think if we read verse 2 again here, we begin to see the context that helps us understand. Verse 2, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And so what's Peter talking about here? He's talking about us putting aside our flesh, submitting to God's will. That's the flow of this passage. Therefore, whenever he discusses ceasing from sin, it's true that in the moment of salvation, we die to the old man and we live in the new, but it is a process of sanctification that we must battle against our flesh. We must battle against the sins of this world. And so Peter here is speaking of a progressive reality. In other words, the more we submit to God, the more we obey him, the more holy and righteous we will live for the glory of Christ, the more we cease or stop walking according to our flesh. Uh, there will not be a point where we reach perfection in this lifetime on this earth. Brother Melvin, I promise we did not plan this, but Brother Melvin read this passage earlier, and it actually works really well. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so the scripture here plainly teaches that if somehow you think that you have reached a point where you have absolutely no sin, that's not a sign that you're perfect. It's a sign that you're deceived. It's not a sign that you're buying into truth. It's a sign that you're buying into lies. Now the question really at this point is for us as we're considering this passage here in First Peter, what does it look like? for us to actually set aside the passions of the flesh. We, we, we see the call to do that, but what does it look like in our lives for us to live according to the will of God? Well, Peter outlines this in verse 3. Look at it with me. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. And so this verse that begins with Peter talking about our past life, the past time, the time when we as believers were unconverted before we had come to faith in Christ. When we were lost, we acted and we did and we fought according to the ways of the world for we were a part of the world. We indulged in the sins of the flesh. We went forward in the lusts that were evil and wicked. And Peter says that was a part of the fact of the past, meaning that it is history. And we must move forward walking in the new life that Christ has given to us. In fact, if you look at this little phrase here, it sums up the unbelieving life very well. Peter says, doing what the Gentiles want to do. That's a perfect summation. If you're looking for just a little short phrase of the unbelieving life, this is what it is. The lost world doesn't look for guidance from God. The lost world doesn't have a heart to come to the word of God and to submit and to obey Christ. Instead, they simply want to do what they want. They simply want to live according to the desires of their sinful flesh. They're taking whatever action feels best to them according to their evil desires. Whatever is the most pleasurable according to sin. And you know, that's a powerful point for us to consider as we're evaluating the flow of this passage. I see so many individuals, I, I talk to people all the time. For one reason or another, they, they decide that they want to live according to how they feel instead of what the Scripture actually says. They see and they feel a sinful desire within themselves, 
a desire to take a certain action, to identify a certain way, or to believe a specific idea. This feeling, it tells them to sin, and so they follow it, and they plunge into sin, they plunge into evil, rebellion, and instead of what Scripture says, instead of being obedient to that, they simply move forward according to the flesh. And in many of these cases, the issue is not that they don't know what the Bible says. The issue is that they know and they don't care. But they would rather follow the flesh instead of submitting to the will of God. And that is a truly sad reality. That is a reality that should grieve our hearts whenever we come across unbelievers and we come across individuals who are dead in their sins and they simply live in rebellion to the word of God. They say something like, I just want to do what makes me feel happy or some kind of a phrase along those lines. And what they mean is they just want to indulge the sins of their flesh. What does it look like whenever someone follows that path? How are they living? What, what characterizes their life? Well, Peter gives a list here. And he opens it by saying that the Gentiles are living in sensuality. Uh, this references the indulgence of sinful flesh, passions of the flesh associated with sexual immorality specifically. They want to act immorally sexually, so they follow that path without any care for what God has commanded. Someone who lives simply based upon their feelings will be given to all kinds of sexual sins and such. But we see that in the world today where uh, people simply are being told to live according to their feelings instead of based upon biblical sexual morality. Ultimately, if we're honest, what the culture wants is simply to change what the Bible says to fit how they feel instead of bringing their feelings into submission to the inerrant word of God. Especially if you think back in Paul's day. Think back into the historical context of ancient Rome. What is he dealing with? We see all kinds of perverse sexual practices today. What would Paul have seen? He, he would have seen the pagan temples built up where all kinds of sexual immorality was occurring. It was dominant in that society. And so Paul, Peter, the apostles, all of them, that is the context of what they were living in. They're living in a culture that is wanting to simply go along with the sinful flesh in flagrant disobedience to God. The next phrase, passions here, it has reference to lusts. It's translated that way several times in the New Testament by the King James Version. Now the term itself, the, the mere Greek word itself, it can either reference a positive desire or a negative desire. Uh, you see it often in the New Testament. It can be used to discuss something sinful, like a lust for power, an evil lust for power that someone might have. Or it can be used to reference a good desire. For example, in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, the Lord actually uses this specific word to discuss his disciples, to call them to eat the Passover meal with them. And he institutes the Lord's Supper in that text. Now that desire by Christ is not bad or sinful. However, Peter here uses this word in context of a list of sins, which means that he obviously has in mind sinful lust, sinful desires in this passage. Obviously, we think of lust, and we think of the Lord's teaching in Matthew 5, 28, that if you lust after a woman, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. And we are right to think here in the context of 1 Peter of that kind of lust, given the mention of sexual immorality here right prior to this word. However, while we're right to think about that, what I want you to see is that we cannot limit it to that category. As I said earlier, you, you can lust after power. You, you can have a sinful lust for money. In fact, you can go on and you can see here that Peter talks about such things as drunkenness. You can absolutely lust after alcohol, having a sinful desire for it to the point where you become a drunkard. And so Peter lists this, this lust, as a way that characterizes the life and the nature of sinners. That whenever we are dead in our sin, we are inclined toward evil. And we want more and more and more and more of it if the grace of God does not act in our lives. And now think about what this means for those who are unbelievers. Uh, 
They live according to their own wants. They live according to their own desires. And according to the scripture, we see that they are inclined towards sin. They lust after sin, which means that a lost person is going to live in the sins of the flesh. That's what their feelings want them to do. That is what their thoughts want to do. That is what their very nature wants to do. And the more that God gives them over to a debased mind, as we saw when we went through Romans 1, the more sinful they will be in their depravity. However, whenever we come to Christ, we are transformed. We are changed, which means that we seek to crucify the acts of the flesh, to crucify those sinful desires. It's not enough for us to have outward conformity. In other words, it's not enough that we simply not act in an immoral way or in a sinful way in front of others. On the basis of being justified, on the basis of being changed by the gospel, we must also not seek to have our outward actions in obedience. We must seek to have our very thoughts. We must seek to have our very desires in alignment with the Word of God. Seeking to get rid of the lusts of the flesh that characterize the life of the unbeliever in this passage. Uh, That it's not just a sanctification of our actions. It's a sanctification of our inward being. It's that we want every single aspect of our life, our thoughts, our actions, our deeds, our feelings, to be in conformity with Christ, to be in accordance with his word. This is a process that we must grow in. This is a process that we grow in from the moment that we are saved until the moment we are called home. Yet the lost sinner, we see here, they indulge the flesh by lusting in one way or another. We see drunkenness, orgies, and drinking parties mentioned here in this text. Drunkenness, of course, it mentions being so consumed with alcohol to a point where you're becoming intoxicated. Uh, The Bible, it condemns drunkenness as a sin over and over and over again. Drunkenness, it demonstrates a heart that is given over to lust because there's an increasing desire for more and more and more. It's obvious that someone has no self-control under the Spirit of God in that situation. Obviously, we, we could say much about alcoholic consumption. Fundamentally, the, the Bible, you'll see it commends it for medical purposes in specific situations. So, for example, in 1 Timothy 5.23, you see the Apostle Paul telling Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach because of his frequent ailments. You have to keep in mind they didn't have the water filtration systems that we have today. Uh, they didn't have any of that type of an advancement. And so oftentimes they would put a little bit of alcohol in their water, a very slight amount, to help with that sort of an issue. Uh, The scripture warns about strong drink in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, when it says that wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Proverbs chapter 31 actually gives us some interesting thoughts. Turn over there with me real quick. Proverbs 31, 4 through 5. Starting in verse 4 here. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed, and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. And so what we see here is that Scripture is urging for those in important positions not to drink wine or strong drink. The last thing that they need is to have their judgment impaired. Uh, The last thing that they need is to make some kind of a decree and completely forget what they did. Uh, They need to be able to make clear decisions, to be able to make clear judgments. If we come down to verses 6 through 7 here in Proverbs 31, notice this. 
Give strong drink to the one who is perishing, and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty, and remember their misery no more. And so here you have another situation where the Bible is advocating for someone to have wine or strong drink, and we would think of this primarily in the context of a medical need. A situation where someone is in severe distress and anguish. I love what Dr. John MacArthur, I think that he makes a good point here, in saying that the type of situation you're dealing with in this passage is probably someone on death row or agonizing in some sort of a severe pain. So for example, if someone had a knife wound in the ancient days, they would have given them an alcohol beverage to help deal with that pain. Obviously today as medical processes have advanced, we have other ways to handle that and more effective ways to handle that situation. Another text to consider is Psalms 104 verses 14 through 15. Turn with me there real quick. Psalm 104 verses 14 through 15 which is talking about God and it says this of God. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. So here in the scripture, it says, among other things, in the context that God himself has made wine to gladden the heart of man. Everything created by God is good, as 1 Timothy 4.4 4 says. So there's nothing inherently sinful about grapes from the vine. We should enjoy them as good gifts from God. But the question is, what is this text discussing whenever it uses that word wine? That, that's the primary thing that we need to consider. Well, the Hebrew word here is the word yayin, which is my southern pronunciation of that Hebrew word, so give me a little bit of grace there, please. But it is yayin, which references a mixed beverage. In other words, alcohol mixed with something else, something like water often, for example. In the ancient world, it would have been viewed as barbarian to drink alcohol straight. Uh, John MacArthur, if you are interested in this, has actually done a tremendous amount of historical research where he, he takes quotes and he sees how they viewed alcohol in the ancient world. It would have been barbarian to view wine that, for example, was one-to-one. -one. would have been considered barbaric if it was mixed one part water, one part wine. The alcoholic content of basically most of the beverages in the ancient world was around 2.25 to 2.7 percent. If you're wondering, that doesn't even classify as an alcoholic beverage today. You have strong drink mentioned in the Bible. Uh, that is a heavier alcoholic content. And so what we see here is that the Bible explicitly condemns drunkenness, says that it is fine in certain contexts to use wine for medicinal purposes, and it is completely condoning of beverages with such a slight alcoholic content that you'd have to sit there all day getting drunk on. Beverages today that we would not even consider to be alcoholic in our own time period. Uh, to give you an example of what we're talking about, something like vodka would be 95 percent alcoholic content that in the Bible days would have been considered barbaric to drink. Something like al al apple juice would be considered 0.66 percent alcoholic content. Orange juice about 0.73 percent. Fermented teas like kombucha would be 1.5 percent. Soy sauce can even come in around 2% alcoholic content. So that gives you an idea of the sort of range that we're talking about when we're talking about that slide of an alcoholic content in the ancient world. And so the Bible, it's giving a lot of wisdom here, which is what I want you to see. It warns against strong alcoholic beverages. Even most of our societies, like lighter alcoholic content beers today would have been heavier than the normal beverage in the ancient world. However, what do we see the Gentiles doing in this particular text, which is the contrast that I want you to see. They would throw drinking parties. They would get drunk. They would proceed and all of that. What is the Bible urging us to understand? It's urging us to understand that strong drink is a baller, to not get drunk, to not consume ourselves with beverages that could make us drunk. Uh, but the sinners that Peter is referencing here, they are given to drunkenness. And I want you to notice that difference between the biblical perspective and the world's view. Someone who is a drunkard, they're simply just wanting to live it up. They're wanting to indulge their sin. Someone who is a Christian fundamentally says, what has God said? What has he said so that I can live in obedience? 
obedience to it. That's the fundamental difference that we're drawn to here in this text. Uh, Not only are they drunkards, they also practice orgies and live in lawless idolatry, as we see at the end of the verse. Someone who practiced orgies was an individual who sought to really be chaotic, causing all kinds of problems. Uh, The particular word has actually been translated as rioting by some translations in texts like Romans 13, 13. And lawless idolatry, uh, many translations do a better job than the ESV on this point. They say it's abominable idolatry. We as believers, we serve the living and the true God. Uh, We're here today not to worship an idol, but to worship the God who has made everything. Uh, The God who actually lives. Unbelievers, if you go through the Old Testament prophets, you see several texts where God mocks the gods of the nations, the false gods of the nations, because they are completely powerless. They have no ability to do anything whatsoever. They are futile. The idolatry of the nations, it is an abomination before God, because they're choosing to worship something made by their hands or envisioned by their mind instead of bowing before the God of creation. And it's amazing how often the God of the unbeliever fits with what they want. That the God of the unbeliever, what he commands, fits with what they want according to the sins of the flesh. That their religion often will allow them to practice whatever it is they desire. They're worshiping a deity with no power whatsoever. Uh, This verse, it not only gives us a pattern for what to avoid, but if you think about it here, we should be doing everything that is the reverse of this passage. So notice this, instead of living in sensuality, orgeries, and passions, we as believers were called to be pure. We're called to live in an orderly way. We should be demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit. Instead of drunkenness, we're called to live in sobriety. We're called to live in self-control. Instead of practicing idolatry, we're called to worship the true and living God, seeking to do everything for His glory. And so do you want to live for the will of God? Do you want to put to death the desires of the flesh? Uh, then on the basis of the salvation that you have been given, cast aside the sinful desires that you have. You're living in a world that wants to tell you that how you live, that the truth of reality is determined by how you feel. The reality is that the Bible says that the heart is deceitful. The heart is desperately wicked. What you and I need is not to live according to how we feel. What you and I need is to submit our feelings, to submit our thoughts to the pure truth of the Word of God, to come to the Scripture and to seek to live in obedience to Him, to seek to know God, to seek to be transformed by Him. And we need to understand that we are battling against the flesh, that we are seeking to be sanctified. Uh, That's part of why we fellowship together, so that we can encourage one another in that, so that we can help one another and strengthen one another as we're going through the struggles and the battles of life, that we can point one another to the Scripture, point one another to go forward in Christ. And what this means is that fundamentally you and I have to take up our cross every single day and deny ourselves. Uh, that we have to wake up every day with a focus upon the Lord, with a locking in, a focus upon obeying His commandments, and a heart that says that we want to die to the sins of the flesh and live to Christ. And if you don't know the Lord savingly, then you have no power to, to crucify the sins of the flesh. Because you must be transformed by the grace of God. You must be regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. You must be born again. You must come to faith in Christ. You must repent of your sins. And then you must walk after Him. You must follow after Him as a result of what He has done in your life. It is not that you work to gain salvation, but you work on the basis that He has given you salvation. You see, your feelings... My feelings, the world's feelings, they don't trump what God has said and what he calls us to do. And so let us see the beauty of the truth of this text. Uh, 
the reality that we as the church, we have been called out of the lost world. We have been saved by the grace of God. And on that basis, we are not to live like the world. And let us also be filled with hearts that are grieved for those who are dead in their sin. That we see the state of the unbeliever in this passage. We see the rebellion against God that they are living in, that they are idolaters, that they are practicing that which is according to the flesh. Uh, Let us truly reflect on that reality and be grieved for them and be spurred on to share the gospel with them that they may come to know Christ, Uh, that they may be set free from the bondage of their sin, or they may be set free from the sins of the flesh, from the ways of the world, set free to walk according to the ways of Christ. And let us go forward in our own lives, seeking to be faithful for His glory. If you need to talk about anything this morning, I'll be standing up here after the service and would love to pray for you, to visit with you, to talk about you, with you about any thoughts or questions you may have. I want to ask Brother Tex, if he would, to come and to lead us in our closing hymn. Bow us in a, bow in a word of prayer here this morning. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for the opportunity to dive into it. We thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, and I ask that you would help us to put to death the desires of the flesh. That, that you would give us humble hearts that seek to look into the word to see where we need to grow. That you would show us how we need to grow by the power of your Holy Spirit. And help us, Lord, not only individually, but together as a local church to be built up, to mature, to grow, and to push one another to you. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.